I'm with Stan the T-Rex of the Morrison Natural History Museum here in Morrison, Colorado. The Morrison Formation, this famous bed of rock from which so many amazing fossils have come. Let's talk about that today. I'm Luke and this is Polymathy. I'm here at the Natural History Museum in Morrison, Colorado with Doug Hartshorn of, uh, of this amazing museum. And I have a question about what is a fossil? Because is it really original bone? Is it, D, you know, is it a mineral replacement? Can DNA be found in it? I really don't understand that continuum. That's one of the most common questions. And it's very scientific. Okay. So it's very easy to identify a fossil. And I like to do it this way. Can you do an L? Yeah. Okay, good. A fossil is a leftover from a living thing from long ago. Uh, leftover from a living thing long ago. About 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. So, if you look right over here in this cabinet, mm -hmm. you'll see some mammoth hair. Is that a fossil? A uh, leftover from a living thing long ago, yes. Definitely a fossil. Uh-huh. It's hair. Would it have DNA in it? Uh, yeah, good. Probably, yeah. And the jaw hair, you can see that looks like dirty bone. So it's slightly mm. mineralized. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, it's been in the ground for a while. Minerals percolate through the ground with water and they get absorbed into the bone and they essentially settle out and they mineralize the bone. So you can have fossils that are pure tissue, you can have fossils that are partially mineralized and like this big femur here to a mammoth, that looks like it could have come out of the ground yesterday. But that bone right there is at least 16,000 years old. Mm. And although it's been in the ground that long, it's not completely mineralized. Mm. Okay. So then you get into your older bones, like we saw in the lab. They've been in the ground so long that almost all of the bony tissue has been replaced, mm. but not all. There's still actual bony tissue in our 150 million year old Jurassic bones, mm -hmm. but you won't find any DNA, mm -hmm. and it's much too long for that. So fossilization is a process, and most people like to think of the end part instead of how they actually start. Mm. So everybody goes, fossil has to be a rock. Like, well, it can be totally rock. Um, sometimes the bone has been completely replaced so all you have is the cast of your original bone, right? Mm. There's nothing left. It's all been completely replaced. Mm. And that we call a natural cast. You see that in snails, a lot of times with um, ammonites and things like that. We're right. not looking at the actual critter. We're looking at everything that replaced that through time. Mm. Does that help? Yeah, it does completely. Because I heard about amazing discoveries like blood vesicles in some form being found inside T. rex femurs, I think, or other bones. And I've, you know, Collagen. What's that? Collagen, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so partially replaced sometimes by Still minerals. being discussed okay. whether that was what it was. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Mm. It could be. Yeah. And um, the thing that most people need to understand is that fossil is a leftover from a living thing from long ago. That's really great. And even hair can be a fossil. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Doug. You're welcome. This is definitely one of my favorite animals of all time because this is the Utah raptor. And like I talked about in a previous video, this animal was discovered after 
the uh, filming of Jurassic Park, the original movie, had begun. But this is essentially the animal that Steven Spielberg had imagined, even though actual velociraptors were relatively small. But this animal is even bigger than those fictional ones depicted in the Jurassic Park films. Utah Raptor, beautiful, amazing predator, dangerous, fearsome, and terrifying, but here depicted in this amazing way. Look, it's got its teeth around its hand, and what is it doing? It's preening, because of all the long feathers it would have had on its arms. Birds today have to spend a huge amount of time uh, cleaning and grooming themselves, preening, and here this animal has been depicted doing just that. Over the Cretaceous, this is about 80 million years ago. And this guy is the largest predator in Colorado when we're underwater. Never gets out on land. This guy has flippers, no legs. And a lot of teeth. Can you see all these teeth in the roof of the mouth? Those are pterygoid teeth. Snakes have those. This guy is the top predator right here in the Jurassic. So about 150 million years ago, this is the top predator here. He's a big dinosaur. A lot of people think, well, that's a T-Rex. He's not. He lived 80 million years before a T-Rex. There's only 66 million years between us and a T-Rex. There's more time between a T-Rex and this guy. How much bigger would the uh, claw have been yeah, on this three quick? Three inches. Three inches of that? That's unbelievable. So that claw is going to come out to here. Wow. And it's really sharp. So if you've ever seen a cat's claw, dog's claw, it's fingernail, just like your fingernails, carrot and cover. But that's the bone. So in the museum, all you're going to see is the bone, right? If you added the theca, it's called the theca, it's going to come out to somewhere in there, add a third at least. And they're just the arm bones to this guy. This guy's 90 feet long, as long as this building, and weighs 40 tons. <laughs> These bones right here are dug up and they get sent back to Yale, to the Peabody Museum, where they've been there for ever since. Don't have a head on it because it was never found until we found the very first one right here. So the rocks were digging right So one day we'll have a head on it. Gigantic dinosaur. The first truly amazing gigantic dinosaur anywhere in the world. And again, 25 feet, you leave the head here. Tail's going to be over in the snaky lizard's mouth. It's a big dinosaur. Yes, it is. How do you get enough food through that little mouth to feed a seven ton? Leave my finger in there for a yeah. Thank you. Scale goes to that foot. Maybe a few months old. Wow. So a model of a baby stegosaurus to scale. They are just little stegosaurs. Wow. They have their plates, they have their little spikes. And this little miniature. And the adult's foot there. And the adult's foot is here. Right here. It's actually like this. This is the slip mark here. Amazing. See the shadow of my finger on the rock? Yes. You see that little footprint right there yeah. off the tip of my finger? Mm. Goes to a baby stegosaur this size. This is just a couple days old. Here's a footprint most people miss. This is just half of an apatosaur footprint. Wow. Yeah, it's that big. Oh my. There's lots of those and that's what it's just a little guy. This one when it's full grown. It's about 110 feet, so about 30 feet longer than this building. But he's really long and skinny. It's still pretty heavy. And your brontosaurs and apatosaurs, pretty beefy, stocky guys. This guy, they'll run 40 tons, somewhere in there. But all plant eaters, and if you look at the teeth, you can see they're eating different plants. Hmm. So they could all hang out here together <laughs> and not be competing for food. Triceratops Trail. And there are footprints, but that one down in the corner is gone. That's one of the reasons it's so important to cast things. This preserves the science. There's another footprint in here, did you say, Matt? 
it's right below the sign. You can see two toes. See the, it's negative, but you can see two of the toes. This would likely be a ceratopsian, just a partial track. You, they get twisted and you have a different root base that's twisted at a different angle relative to the crown itself. But the roots and the crowns are in line up here. The teeth of the premaxilla and the first two positions here are kind of D-shaped in profile. The teeth here in the back, they're, they're your slicers. These are the grabbers, parasers. And these are the nibblers. Technical terms. It was just a small portion of the skull here with two partial horns. Send it back to Professor Marsh. Did you see that at Yale? It's at the Smithsonian. It's at the Smithsonian? Yeah, that part right there. So if those weird horns belong to a mammal, that thing's split in mammals and amphibians too. So the acephalocon that was split into two little tabs but in dinosaurs, it's unified in a single ball joint. And so Marsh realized right away that, nah, this is in bison. So he renamed the Denver specimen, Ceratops alticornis. And a year later, they found the Dinotriceratops skull that was mostly complete in one. Renamed it again. I'm the guy that cleans the toilet sometimes. Maybe that's a Here is a close-up of Stan the T-Rex. Look at these perforations into the skull. Could this have been from other T-Rexes fighting this animal, or even from the horns of Triceratops trying to fend off its would-be assassin? For more videos on science, history, language, and technology, subscribe to Plymouthy. Thanks so much for watching, and thanks especially to all of my Patreon supporters. Walete.